Alberta Premier Daniel Smith has been taking a lot of heat lately after announcing that her government will be making changes which will boost parental rights when it comes to transgender and personal pronoun issues for minors. Now to chat about this in more detail is Shel Landry, who is a parent herself and one of the leaders of Freedom Hub Lethbridge. Shel, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. You bet. Now, first of all, why don't you explain to our viewers what Freedom Hub is all about? So Freedom Hub is just a community group that I started in um, 2021. And so it's kind of a spot where people can come together, build community and support each other in our rights. And um, it's really important to just know people in your community, right? So I kind of wanted to build that. Now, Premier Daniel Smith was talking a bit about gender reassignment surgery and the fact that it'll be banned in Alberta for those 17 and under. Uh, Smith says, since this is a life-altering decision with permanent consequences, that it's best left for adults to decide, not children, not minors. Critics are calling this a very cruel decision. What are your thoughts? I think the critics are a little confused as to what it means to protect children. <laughs> um, I absolutely love what Danielle has put forward. And I think that it is definitely time to see uh, our politicians step up and help protect the children and parental rights and the children's rights, because this is about our parental rights to protect the children, right? So as a minor, they're not able to make certain decisions for themselves. Um, you know, they may think that they know what they want, but children change their mind as they grow and develop. And it is very important that we make sure that we're not putting them in harm's way just to appease public opinion, because that's how people get hurt. There's so many children who have had reassignment surgery or taken hormones and live to regret it. So it's it can be very dangerous to do this to children. And in encouraging uh, trans gender transition in minors is very dangerous. So I absolutely love that our premier has stepped up to the plate and put forth action to protect children and parental rights. There appears to be a lot of media attention focused on the LGBTQ2 plus community, their supporters, who call the premier's decision deplorable, many within that community. There's also reaction outside of our borders here in Alberta and even outside of Canada. What feedback are you observing outside of the mainstream media? I'm observing that in our community, people are happy with um, these policies. Um, there is a lot of backlash, yes. Uh, a lot of the things we see online um, may include more of that backlash just because of censorship and um, the people who have the opinion or the, the parents and the, the community members who support this are being censored. And so their voices aren't being heard to, and they're looking like the minority when in actuality, it is um, those who are pro gender transition for minors that are the minority. And we cannot pander to the minority just to um, appease them when it's putting our children at risk. Now, puberty blockers and hormone therapies would also not be allowed except for those who've already begun the process, Shell. Again, those opposed say this discriminates against the trans community, particularly the puberty blockers, which are very time sensitive. What are your thoughts on these kind of treatments? Oh, well, <laughs> my thoughts are that uh, it's, it's so dangerous to give children any kind of drugs or treatment that could cause long-term damage. And we've seen that, there's evidence of that. So it's very, very important that we keep a stand on this and um, educate those who are opposed because they probably don't understand the implications of these hormone therapies. These drugs that they give to children are the same drugs that they would give to a pedophile to medically castrate them. Um, it would make children infertile for the rest of their lives. So if they grow up and decide, well, I actually want kids, they won't be able to. And that's not a decision about having kids to make when you're a kid, because kids don't even have that on their purview. They 
they aren't thinking about, I want to be a, a mom or a dad. And some kids do think about that, but it's not really until you're past that puberty stage, um, you know, closer to maybe 18, 19, 20, or even 25, or some people wait till 30 before they're like, yeah, actually I want to have kids. Um, so it's important we don't take that option away. Uh, it's irreversible. And these hormone therapies cause extreme health damage. You know, there's, it shortens the lifespan um, of a person who has these treatments done and it breaks down their bones. It's, it's just really detrimental to the physical being of the person, especially minor children. You don't want to be messing around with those um, natural chemical um, hormones in the body by adding in extra things. And we do have research data on how these affect children, um, but we need more, you know, and it's not a good idea to continue giving children these um, medications until, you know, maybe there is more research coming out in 20 years or 30 years when we can see the effects that have happened on the children who have already undergone these things. Um, but we don't want our children to be lab rats. You know, it's really important to make sure we protect their health and their safety and not just their physical well-being, but also their mental well-being. Um, there is an increased rate of depression, suicide and other long term or um, well, life ending effects of giving children these hormones and it doesn't change how they feel. It just changes them physically. The mutilation is separate from the feeling, the psychology, the emotion. It's more important to give these children the help that they need, the support that they need, the counseling, making sure they know we're there for them and that we love them. And by no means is it discriminating to show a child that you love them and to protect them. And I think that discrimination has been thrown around so much in so many different arenas that a lot of people have started to forget what discrimination actually is. And protecting children is not discrimination. It's the opposite. It's protecting those transgender kids or the kids who may transition one day. It's protecting their right to, to learn and grow, know who they are, have a healthy body, have a healthy mind, have the support that they need. So when it is time, say when they turn 18, after they're 17, when their body's more developed, they have a little bit more of critical thinking experience and ability um, and the support system that they've built um, throughout their teen years where they've been considering these things. It is a process. You can't just jump in, throw these kids under the knife or give them a bottle of, of hormones and expect that there's going to be a, a great outcome for everyone. Because also you have to think about everybody is different. So not everyone's going to respond to the hormone treatments the same. Some people might have different physical adverse reactions than others. And it's just so important to just allow them the time to grow and to become who they are without the medical interference. Now, Shell, Alberta will require parental consent for students 15 and under who want to change their names or pronouns at school. Now, students 16 and 17 would not need consent, but their parents will still have to be notified. Now, the main concern from those opposed seems to be that this would cause trans students to be outed to their parents who may disagree with their choices. Now, some argue this could be very dangerous for students. What are your thoughts? Well, they say it would be dangerous for students. So um, from what I've heard, they're implying it would be dangerous for the students because of their families and their parents, which I feel is far from the truth. There, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are probably some families and parents who would absolutely not accept their child's decisions or feelings and not be supportive. And that's when we need to make sure that there is help for them and a support system that we can build. But the majority of parents will not turn on their children and make things harder for them. 
as a mom, I know I will do whatever I can to make sure that my child's well-being is put first. I will make sure that I'm building a relationship with them and and not just around this issue. I think that this isn't an, an issue of, um, you know, accusing every parent that they're going to be mean or hate their child or, or cause problems for them if they disagree with them. But I think we need to really support parents in teaching them how to communicate with their children, especially, you know, the youth that may be going through these questions or um, trying to find their identity. So if we have support for parents and support for the family as a unit as well, so that they can understand each other, communicate and create that support system. So Shell, what would you say to kids who've seen school as their only haven, where they feel that they can truly be themselves, where they actually feel safe, maybe safer than at home? Well, I think that they should create a support system at school then, you know, like we have, we have systems in place in school and I think they can always be improved upon, but creating a support system for that student through their friends, through their teachers or a counselor or um, maybe some other, adult volunteers. I don't know if that would, you know, if they've got obviously checked um, to enter the school and to create a support system in the schools for these kids who feel they cannot go to their parents. But I think it is important that parents know if their child is claiming a different name or a pronoun at school that's different from their school records, it's important for the school to communicate with the parents about their children on all issues that may, may get um, that may grow into something bigger. So if it's something that can affect the child's health, well-being, their education, their social um, aspects around school and family, it's important the school is communicating with the parents so that they can create that support system for them. And if the school feels the parents may not be um, receptive or supportive to the student, um, then they can arrange to have some supports put in place. And I know that the schools do have great support systems. They do have um, a lot of connecting resources. I've used them with my daughter in school, and they're really happy and willing to communicate with you and work out plans. And the students need to also maybe be more made more aware of that, that they do have support systems in school. Um, if they feel like they can't talk to their family or the parents. Um, it's just so important that communication is kept open. And if parents are shut out of the conversation before it gets started, they don't have the option to support their child. That's taking away an opportunity for the child to feel love and support. And it's so important. Like, I can't stress how much I feel that's important. I, I have really strive to create a good relationship with my child as I'm sure most other parents have and the few parents that haven't that may struggle with knowing how to talk to their kids about these things you know there there are community supports and if they don't have access to them or aren't aware of them maybe these uh, community support services could be boosted in advertisement or promotion on the school newsletters on the school website you know like if you need help communicating or um, talking to your kids about these things or things that they're going through, it would be really beneficial to have that system where parents can actually know where to access that and where students can know where to access that. Now in the classroom, schools will be required to notify parents when teachers will be teaching on gender identity, human sexuality and sexual orientation. Parents will need to give consent and they'll have the option to maybe opt their kids out of that class. Some say this is creating some division. How do you see it? Well, I don't think it's creating division. And I think that it's right in line with how things have always been when it comes to discussions about se the sexual nature in school. You know, even way back when I was in school, you know, we had theme five. Parents had to sign a permission form, you, you know, to opt you in for that class. This is no different. Um, it's just a little bit, um, I would say, expanded because times have changed. There are different things happening. 
um, for youth now, that, or well, some of the things are the same, but I mean, it's, it's an increased amount of what's happening um, with youth right now in society as time goes on, things will continue to change. But it is a really good system in place that has been a long time in, uh, in a long time and getting permission from parents for sexual content classes has always been a thing. And this policy is just reinforcing that. It's not adding anything new. Now, Premier Smith also has an interesting proposal when it comes to sports and uh, trans women competing against uh, biological females in sports. This will not be allowed. Now, the province will look at allowing trans kids to compete in co-ed leagues. Critics say this will really paint trans youth as villains, but others say it'll really protect the integrity of female sports. How do you see it? See, I think that's a great thing, and not just to protect the integrity of female sports, which is the focus on attacking that you know the female sport um, is what I've noticed is the target. Um, I don't think that it's targeting women's sports to have co-ed. Um, sports available. I think that it's opening an opportunity so it can decrease discrimination and it can create more opportunities for kids to be involved in any sport or activity that they would like to where they may feel uncomfortable say if they're a trans female would they feel just as comfortable playing on the boys team you know I think that would even open discrimination against them you know if there's boys on the team who are thinking like oh well but you're actually a girl you can't play on this team I mean you're you know you're a boy but you know you know they kind of throw that around and twist it up where this person may feel attacked or unsafe and we saw that a lot in the past with going through all the gay rights and things you know and I think that it's there has been a big fight in the past for rights, for gay rights. And I think it's great that we have those now, you know, as somebody who is LGTB, I just, I think that it's great that we have the support and we have the same rights as everyone else. And it took a long time to get that recognized. And this movement to try to shame anybody who doesn't jump on board or, um, fall in line with 100% with the beliefs of this transgender community. Um, well, not just the transgender community, but the, I would say more like the left community that is pushing this idea that there's this transgender um, attack. And there isn't. I think that it's just something that people are shining a spotlight on to create more problems. And Daniel Smith's proposal of these policies is the opposite. It is showing support for transgender children. It is showing support for the families. It's showing that we can find solutions to work together and there doesn't need to be the division. There doesn't need to be discrimination against anyone. And we just need to support each other, you know? <laughs> Love makes the world go round, if you really think about it. It's the only way to make success and to grow. Shell Landry is one of the leaders of Freedom Hub Lethbridge and a concerned parent. Shell, thanks so much for joining us today from Lethbridge. Thank you.